admit that jailers like at the uh, Tucker farm down in Arkansas who get uh, depending on a mood that would trigger one or I just was in shock we're only 15 men who didn't dress or look any different than lots of student types physical objects my possessions other people's destruction of things that are cared about and then destruction of things crime Edmund Emil Kemper III born on December 18th 1948 is an infamous American serial slayer who committed a series of heinous crimes between May 1972 and April 1973. His victims included eight individuals, among them a 15-year-old girl, his own mother, and her best friend. What sets Kemper apart is the chilling fact that he had also slayed his paternal grandparents when he was just 15 years old. Kemper gained notoriety as a co-ed slayer due to his modus operandi of targeting female college students who were hitchhiking in the Santa Cruz County area of California. His crimes were marked by extreme brutality, involving acts such as necrophilia, decapitation, and dismemberment. In 1973, Kemper stood trial and was deemed legally sane, ultimately pleading guilty to his crimes. Strangely, he requested the demise penalty, but it was not an option at the time in California. Instead, he was sentenced to eight concurrent life sentences, ensuring he would spend the rest of his life behind bars. Since his conviction, Kemper has been incarcerated at the California Medical Facility in Vacaville. This facility specializes in providing medical and mental health care to inmates. It is a place where individuals with complex medical needs, including those with severe mental health issues, are housed and treated. Early Life Edmund Emil Kemper III had a tumultuous upbringing marked by dysfunctional family dynamics and early signs of disturbing behavior. He was the middle child of three, with two sisters, Susan and Alan. His parents, Clarnell and Edmund Jr., had a strained relationship. Edmund Jr. was a World War II veteran turned electrician, while Clarnell often belittled his job as menial. Kemper's size was notable from a young age weighing a staggering 13 pounds at birth and standing head and shoulders above his peers by the age of four. However, his behavior was deeply troubling. At just 10 years old, he committed a horrifying act of animal cruelty, burying a pet cat alive, exhuming it, decapitating it, and displaying its head on a spike. This early display of sadistic behavior was an alarming sign of things to come. The darkness within Kemper escalated as he grew older, at 13, he slayed another family cat out of jealousy towards his younger sister, Alan. He kept macabre souvenirs of this act hidden in his closet. Kemper also exhibited a twisted fascination with demise and violence. He confessed to deriving pleasures from deceiving his family about the cat slayings. Disturbingly, Kemper's imagination took a morbid turn. He engaged in bizarre rituals with his sister's dolls, culminating in their decapitation and dismemberment. With his elder sister, Susan, teased him about his teacher. He responded with a chilling remark about slaying her before kissing her. He admitted to sneaking out of his house, armed with a bayonet, to spy on his second grade teacher through her windows. Kemper's childhood games were equally alarming. He played gas chamber and electric chair with his younger sister, instructing her to tie him up and simulate his ending. He would convulse and feign demise imitating gas inhalation or electric shock. Alongside his unsettling activities, Kemper narrowly escaped demise on several occasions. His sister tried to push him in front of a train and into a deep pool where he nearly drowned. Despite his troubled disposition, Kemper shared a close bond with his father. However, when his parents divorced in 1961, he was sent to live with his abusive mother, Clarnell, in Helena, Montana. Their relationship was profoundly dysfunctional. Clarnell, a neurotic and alcoholic, subjected Kemper to constant belittlement, humiliation, and misuse. She even forced him to sleep in a locked basement due to unfounded fears that he might harm his sisters. Clarnell's cruelty extended to mocking her son's imposing stature. Standing at 6 feet 4 inches, 1.93 meters, by the age of 15, 
and labeling him a real weirdo in conversations with his father, unaware that he was listening. Clarnell's emotional misuse knew no bounds. She refused to display any affection towards Kemper, fearing it would turn him by, and repeatedly told him that he would never be loved by any woman. Kemper later described his mother as a sick, angry woman, suggesting she may have had borderline personality disorder. The breaking point for Kemper came at the age of 14, when he ran away from home in an attempt to reunite with his father in Van Nuys, California. To his dismay, he discovered that his father had remarried and now had a stepson. After a brief stay with his father, Kemper was sent to live with his paternal grandparents in Northfolk, California. This arrangement further fueled his resentment as he described his grandfather as senile and accused his grandmother of emasculating him and his grandfather. In this tumultuous environment, Kemper's troubled psyche continued to evolve. His early years were marked by disturbing behaviors, including cruelty to animals, fascination with demise, and a dysfunctional family life characterized by parental neglect and misuse. These factors would set the stage for the horrifying acts he would commit as a serial slayer in the years to come. First Slayings Edmund Kemper's first slayings marked a horrifying turn in his already troubled life. Edmund Kemper's descent into violence began on August 27, 1964, within the confines of his family home in California. At the age of 15, he found himself in a heated argument with his grandmother, Maud Matilda Kemper. This altercation was a culmination of pent-up frustrations and unresolved issues within their already troubled family dynamic. In a moment of explosive rage, Kemper abruptly left the room, seeking solace in an act that would forever alter the course of his life. Returning with a rifle that had been given to him by his grandfather, Kemper stood before his grandmother. With chilling determination, he fired a single shot, ending her life in an instant. The brutality of the act was further underscored by the fact that Kemper, seemingly devoid of remorse, proceeded to discharge two more rounds into her back. The aftermath was nothing short of a macabre scene, with Maud's lifeless body bearing the horrifying evidence of Kemper's violence. In a haunting twist, her final words, Oh, you'd better not be shooting the birds again, served as an eerie testament to the senseless brutality that had just unfolded. Shockingly, the violence did not cease with his grandmother. Some accounts suggest that Kemper, in a disturbing escalation of brutality, inflicting additional post-mortem knife wounds using a kitchen knife. This ghastly detail paints a vivid picture of the depths of Kemper's disturbed psyche. Tragically, Kemper's grandfather, Edmund Emil Kemper Sr., returned home. As an ordinary person most of my life, even though I was living a parallel and increasingly sick life, a bit and admit that jailers like at the uh, Tucker farm down in Arkansas who get am I looking am I am I a masochist am I looking to be tormented further I'm trying to show you just how house and people who came by never left you know? mm -hmm. whole families individual travelers <laughs> would go on for years uh, depending on a mood that would trigger one or the other and out at the same time that means they run consecutively? Oh, no, that's the opposite of consecutive. Yeah. Consecutive, wrong and violently outspoken position on men for much of my upbringing. Do you think uh, society should do in general with uh, serial killers? Do with them? Like that. There's a lot that leads into that happening, but that is what happened. They represented not what my mother was, but... And feed them and house them and clothe them for decades. But... Utterly unaware of the horrifying events that had transpired within the walls of his own residence, as he approached the driveway, he was met with a barrage of gunfire. The elderly man, who had likely just completed a routine grocery run, was gunned down, becoming another victim of Kemper's violent rampage. In the aftermath of the bloodshed, Kemper was left in a state of eerie calm. Faced with the weight of his actions, he reached out to his mother for guidance. It was her voice that provided him with the direction he sought. She advised him to contact the authorities, a directive that Kemper carried out with a chilling sense of detachment. 
The subsequent investigation and legal proceedings cast a harsh light on the disturbing motives behind these slayings. Kemper's confession revealed the disturbing truth. He had taken his grandmother's life simply to experience the sensation of slaying. In a perverse twist of logic, he justified the slayings of his grandfather as an act of sparing him the anguish of discovering his wife's lifeless body. Under the belief that the grief would be directed towards Kemper himself, psychiatrist Donald Lund, who would later analyze Kemper, offered invaluable insight into the warped psychology underlying these actions. He suggested that, in Kemper's deeply disturbed mind, these slings were an act of retribution, a form of revenge against the perceived abandonment he had endured from both his father and mother. The gravity of Kemper's crimes was not lost on the court-appointed psychiatrists tasked with understanding the incomprehensible actions of a 15-year-old. His diagnosis of paranoid schizophrenia painted a grim picture of his mental state, illustrating a mind plagued with delusions and hallucinations. Given the severity of his crimes and the complexity of his mental health, Kemper was deemed unfit for a standard correctional facility. Instead, he was committed to a Tuscadero State Hospital, a facility designed to cater to the needs of mentally ill offenders, providing them with specialized treatment and care. These first slings marked a dark, harrowing turning point in Kemper's life. The brutality and calculated nature of these acts serves as a chilling testament to the depths of his depravity. They set the stage for a series of even more horrifying crimes that would cement Kemper's place in the annals of American criminal history. The events of that fateful day remain an indelible stain on the collective memory, a stark reminder of the capacity of unfathomable violence within the human psyche. Kemper's Atascadero Rehabilitation Journey Edmund Kemper's life took a dramatic turn when he was committed to Atascadero State Hospital after the gruesome slayings of his grandparents in 1964. This period of imprisonment and psychiatric evaluation would reveal a complex and chilling aspect of his character. Upon his arrival at Atascadero, the initial assessments and diagnosis differed significantly from those made by the court-appointed psychiatrists during his trial. The California Youth Authority psychiatrists and social workers at Atascadero did not find the same signs of severe mental illness. Their reports indicated that Kemper did not display flight of ideas, interference with thought, delusions, hallucinations, or bizarre thinking. Instead, they noted his intelligence and introspective nature. Remarkably, Kemper's IQ was tested at 136 during his time at Atascadero, which was more than two standard deviations above the average. Later, he underwent another IQ test, yielding an even higher score of 145. These test results painted a picture of a highly intelligent individual, whose mental capacity stood out in stark contrast to his gruesome crimes. Kemper's time at Atascadero was marked by his efforts, to rehabilitate himself and portray himself as a model prisoner. He actively participated in psychiatric assessments and even received training to administer psychiatric tests to fellow inmates. This willingness to work cooperatively with the staff earned him the favor of the psychiatrists, who found him to be an exceptional worker. A psychiatrist later noted, he was a very good worker, and this is not typical of a sociopath. He really took pride in his work. In a surprising twist, Kemper also became a member of the JCs while at Atascadero. More notably, he claimed to have made contributions to the field of psychiatric testing during his interactions with the hospital psychiatrists. Specifically, he mentioned developing a scale called the Overt Hostility Scale as a part of his work with the Minnesota Multifasic Personality Inventory a widely used psychological assessment tool. However, it was during this time that Kemper revealed the disturbing facet of his character. And out of nowhere, they found a skull up in the mountains near Loma Prieta. Homicides in those days. Uh, so we did not have a whole lot of experience in doing this sort of thing. Do an inquiry, I could go into the computer, find somebody's criminal history, that sort of thing. Sometimes we refer to this as the golden age of criminalistics. And the reason we do that is we used all sorts of other charts. They also will include dental charts. So we got those dental charts compared them to the one that we had from the skull. He confessed to manipulating his psychiatrists, 
citing his ability to understand the inner workings of the tests he administered to other inmates. In a chilling admission, he acknowledged learning from the physical activity offenders he evaluated, using this knowledge to manipulate and deceive the very professionals who were tasked with assessing his mental state. Kemper's time at the Tascadero was a complex period in his life. On one hand, he demonstrated a high level of intelligence and cooperated with the psychiatric staff, even making contributions to their work. His capacity for manipulation and his ability to present a facade of rehabilitation raised troubling questions about the true nature of his character. These experiences would foreshadow the enigmatic and multifaceted personality of Edmund Kemper, providing a glimpse into the mind of a deeply disturbed individual capable of both cooperation and manipulation. His time at the Tascadero served as a prelude to the even more horrifying crimes he would commit in the future, leaving a haunting legacy in the annals of American criminal history. Kemper's Release and Transformation After being released on parole from a Tascadero on his 21st birthday, December 18, 1969, Edmund Kemper's life took a significant turn. Contrary to the advice of hospital psychiatrists, Kemper was entrusted to the care of his mother, Clarnell, who had previously remarried and taken the surname Strandberg before later divorcing again. She was residing in Aptos, California, not far from her job as an administrative assistant at the University of California, Santa Cruz. In a bid to prove his rehabilitation, Kemper actively engaged with his psychiatrist and demonstrated positive progress. This eventually led to the permanent expungement of his juvenile records on November 29, 1972. The probation psychiatrists noted that, based on their evaluations, Kemper appeared to be a well-adjusted young man with initiative, intelligence, and no apparent psychiatric illnesses. They even advocated for the permanent expunction of his juvenile records, believing it would afford him the opportunity to develop his potential as an adult. During his time with his mother, Kemper adhered to the requirements of his parole by attending community college. He harbored aspirations of becoming a police officer, a dream that was dashed due to his imposing stature. Standing at an imposing 6 feet 9 inches tall, he earned the moniker Big Ed. Despite this rejection, Kemper maintained amicable relationships with local police officers and frequented a bar called the Jury Room a popular hangout for law enforcement in the area. Kemper initially worked in various low-level jobs before finding employment with the state of California divisions of highways. However, his relationship with Clarnell remained fraught with toxicity and hostility. They engaged in frequent and volatile arguments that were often overheard by neighbors. Kemper vividly described these intense conflicts, revealing the deep-seated discord between mother and son. Frustrated by the ongoing tension, Kemper eventually moved in with a friend in Alameda once he had saved enough money. However, he still found it challenging to fully distance himself from his mother. Physical objects, my possessions, other people's, destruction of things that are cared about, and then destruction of things or a gap. Or, let's say an adult came along and started sharing something with them or showed them a new avenue of... Uh, to get me. And I knew I was paranoid at that moment. I knew anybody that came up there and gave me a funny look or a fishy eye or... There. She uh, kind of preceded this female movement we have now of getting rights, of getting equal rights, of getting equal... Give her a Christmas present. Leave her alone. She got her pound of flesh out of you. I wasn't sniveling about my mother to them. I didn't like to hear what they had to say about it. ...developed, and I'm, I'm not, it's not fair to talk about a dead person that way. They can't defend themselves. They can't give you another perspective on what... Really ...talk to me again. It was awful. It wasn't sexual or grabbing at her and I was just such a dork taking her to a John Wayne movie that's normal not necessarily healthy but that happens and my dad being the wimp out of his family who incessantly called and made surprise visits financial difficulties further complicated his situation leading him to return to his mother's apartment in Aptos frequently during this time in his early 20s Kemper became engaged to a student from Turlock High School in March 1973 the engagement endured for over a year before being terminated due to Kemper's second arrest. The young woman's identity was kept private at her parents' request, and she was reportedly 17 and still attending high school at the time. In the same period, 
Kemper faced a life-altering event when he was struck by a car while riding his newly acquired motorcycle. This accident resulted in a severe arm injury, prompting him to file a civil suit against the driver and ultimately receiving a substantial settlement. With part of the settlement money, he purchased the 1969 Ford Galaxy. It was during this time that he began to notice a significant number of young women hitchhiking, which ignited a dark pattern of behavior. He started equipping his car with plastic bags, knives, blankets, and handcuffs. Initially, he picked up these young women and let them go without harm, but it was the emergence of homicidal physical urges which he chillingly referred to as his Lil Zappos, that eventually led him to act on these impulses. Kemper's growing rage and the deep-seated societal frustrations he harbored played a sinister role in the dark path he was about to embark upon. His encounters with hitchhikers would ultimately pave the way for a series of horrifying crimes that would cement his status as one of America's most infamous serial slayers. Between May 1972 and April 1973, Ed Edmund Kemper embarked on a horrifying slaying spree, claiming the lives of eight victims, all of whom were young women. His method of operation was chillingly systematic. Kemper would prey on female students hitchhiking, luring them to isolated locations where he subjected them to brutal acts of violence. His victims met their end through various means, including shootings, knifings, suffocations, and strangulations. Kemper's atrocities did not end with their demises. He would transport their lifeless bodies back to their residence, where he committed further unspeakable acts. At his home, Kemper engaged in macabre ritual. He decapitated the victims, indulged in necrophilic acts, and then dismembered their remains. This grotesque pattern of behavior was the grim aftermath of his slaying acts, reflecting the depth of his depravity. Targets of Tragedy During this 11-month reign of terror, Kemper's victims included five college students, a high school student, his own mother, and his mother's best friend. It is worth noting that Kemper himself acknowledged that he often sought out victims following heated arguments with his mother who had intentionally isolated him from the women associated with her workplace. Kemper revealed that his mother would deride him. Psychiatrists and Kemper himself have proposed a disturbing theory regarding his choice of victims. They believe that the young women he targeted served as substitutes for his ultimate target, his mother. The Tragic Fates of Marianne Pesci and Anita Lucessa On May 7, 1972, Kemper's slaying spree began with the brutal slayings of Marianne Pesci and Anita Mary Lucessa, both 18-year-old students from Fresno State University. Posing as a good Samaritan, Kemper offered to drive them to Stanford University. However, he diverted from the agreed-upon route, taking them to a remote wooded area near Alameda, known to him from his work at the highway department. There, he committed unspeakable acts. First handcuffing Pesci and locking Lucessa in the trunk before taking their lives. The chilling detail emerged that, in the midst of this horror, Kemper's actions were momentarily interrupted by an accidental touch, an event he bizarrely acknowledged. Kemper later justified his choice of victims, claiming they appeared to belong to a more privileged social class. The Tragic Fate of Aiko Ku On September 14, 1972, Kemper encountered Aiko Ku, a 14-year-old dance student who had resorted to hitchhiking after missing her bus to a dance class. Kemper's manipulation led them to a remote area, where he subjected Ku to a nightmarish ordeal. After attacking and slaying her, Kemper concealed her body in his car and nonchalantly went for drinks before returning to his apartment. There, he committed further heinous acts before dismembering and disposing of her remains. The Tragic Fate of Cynthia Shaw On January 7, 1973, Edmund Kemper encountered his victim, 18-year-old student Cindy Shaw, near the Cabrillo College campus. Using manipulation, he coerced her into his car and drove to a secluded area, where he callously shot her with a 22 caliber pistol. He then callously transported her lifeless body to his mother's residence. Once there, 
Kemper committed a series of horrifying acts. He engaged in physical intercourse with Cindy's lifeless body, proceeded to remove the bullet from her, and then carried out a gruesome dismemberment and decapitation in his mother's bathtub. Subsequently, Kemper retained Cindy's severed head for a prolonged period, using it in appalling acts of necrophilia. Eventually, he chose to bury the head in his mother's garden, a perverse gesture directed towards her. The remainder of Cindy's remains, save for her head and right hand, were discarded, and over the ensuing weeks, investigators painstakingly reconstructed the grisly puzzle. The Tragic Fate of Rosalind Thorpe in Allison Liu On February 5, 1973, Edmund Kemper sought out victims on the campus of UCSC. He targeted two students, 23-year-old Rosalind Heather Thorpe and 20-year-old Alice Helen Allison Liu. Kemper utilized the sticker he obtained from his mother, who worked at the university, to approach them. In a horrific act, he fatally shot both Rosalind and Allison. After the slayings, Kemper took the victims' lifeless bodies to his car, where he proceeded to behead them. He then transported the headless corpses to his mother's residence. There, he committed further abhorrent acts, engaging in necrophilia with the remains, dismembering them, and removing the bullets to hinder identification. In the aftermath of these heinous crimes, some of the victims' remains were discovered at various locations over the ensuing weeks. The Tragic Fate of Clarnell Strandberg On April 20, 1973, Clarnell Strandberg tragically became the victim of her own son, Kemper. After Kemper returned home from a party, he launched a horrifying attack on his mother, who was peacefully engrossed in a book in her bed. Employing a claw hammer, he subjected her to a savage beating before using a penknife to slit her throat. The brutality didn't end there. Kemper proceeded to decapitate his mother and subjected her remains to further acts of unspeakable desecration. This included displaying her severed head, shouting at it, and even using it as a target for thrown darts. In a horrifying twist, he removed Clarnell's tongue and larynx, adding to the shocking brutality of his actions. After committing this atrocious act, Kemper concealed his mother's lifeless body within a closet attempting to hide the grim aftermath of his heinous crime. Trial Edmund Kemper's trial began on October 23, 1973, after he was indicted on eight counts of first-degree slaying on May 7, 1973. Kemper was represented by the chief public defender of Santa Cruz County, attorney Jim Jackson. Given Kemper's explicit and detailed confession, his defense's primary strategy was to plead not guilty by reason of insanity. During his time in custody, Kemper attempted suicide twice, underscoring the gravity of the charges against him. At the trial, three court-appointed psychiatrists examined Kemper and concluded that he was legally sane. Dr. Joel Forth, one of the psychiatrists, delved into Kemper's juvenile records and the previous diagnosis of psychosis. He also conducted interviews with Kemper, even using truth serum. Fort informed the court about Kemper's disturbing claim of cannibalism, stating that he allegedly cut flesh from his victim's legs, cooked it, and consumed it. However, Fort ultimately determined that Kemper was fully aware of his actions in each case and suggesting that Kemper revealed in the notoriety of being labeled a slayer. Kemper later retracted his confession of cannibalism. The trial applied the McNaughton Standard, which required the defendant to prove that, at the time of the act, they were incapable of understanding the nature and quality of their actions due to a mental illness. Despite Kemper's troubled mental state, it was evident that he knew the nature of his acts and exhibited signs of premeditation. We were good friends. We worked a lot of cases together. The person that saw them getting into a car and that's about as far as we got at that time. This is the point at which the kids now have to adjust to a whole new place of living. I just was in shock. We're only 15. Surprising, because that's really a fantasy of total control over others. What's that? 
and um, I get on the bus. Kemper himself took the stands on November 1st and testified that he slayed his victims because he wanted to possess them. He attempted to convince the jury that his actions could only be the result of an abnormal mind. He claimed that two distinct personalities resided within him and that the Slayer personality would take over, leading to a kind of blackout. After five hours of deliberation on November 8, 1973, the jury declared Kemper sane and guilty on all counts. Although Kemper requested the demise penalty, capital punishment was under moratorium in California at the time. Consequently, he received seven years to life for each count, to be served concurrently. Kemper's Evolving Diagnosis During Kemper's trial for the slayings of his grandparents, court-appointed psychiatrists diagnosed him with paranoid schizophrenia. The diagnosis was based on their evaluation of his mental state at the time. However, there was a notable disagreement among mental health professionals. The psychiatrists at the California Youth Authority and social workers at the Tascadero State Hospital, where Kemper was held, contested this diagnosis. They argued that Kemper did not exhibit key symptoms of paranoid schizophrenia, such as a disorganized thought process, hallucinations, or delusions. Instead, they noted that he displayed a high level of intelligence and introspection and his thought patterns were logical and coherent. As a result of this difference in professional opinion, Kemper underwent a re-evaluation of his mental condition. In this process, he was re-diagnosed with a personality trait disturbance, passive-aggressive type. This new diagnosis indicated that Kemper exhibited traits associated with passive-aggressive behavior, which could manifest as resistance to authority or hostility in an indirect manner. Upon his transfer to the California's medical facility in 1973, Kemper's mental state was once again subject to evaluation. This time, psychiatrists identified a combination of antisocial, narcissistic, and schizotypal personality disorders. These disorders collectively suggested a pattern of behavior characterized by a disregard for the rights of others an inflated sense of self-importance and tendencies towards social isolation and eccentricity. This complex journey through various diagnoses highlights the challenges mental health professionals faced in accurately assessing Kemper's condition. Kemper's Disturbing Confession In his final statements, Edmund Kemper, a serial slayer who took the lives of several young women, reflects on his actions, motivations, and the profound impact on his life. He begins by acknowledging that he is not an expert or an authority, but rather someone who committed heinous crimes for almost two decades. Kemper starts by addressing the unsettling possibility that there may be more individuals engaging in similar crimes. He hints that the number of potential offenders might be higher than one would expect in society. He attributes his ability to evade captures for so long to the fact that he could present himself as an ordinary, non-threatening person to his victims. Reflecting on his own motivations, Kemper delves into the psychological turmoil that drove him to commit these gruesome acts. He revealed that his slayings were driven by deep-seated emotional and psychological issues, including feelings of impotence in social and physical interactions. He sought control and ownership over his victims as a way to cope with these overwhelming emotions. Kemper speaks about the duality of his life, how he could seamlessly switch between his normal persona and his alter ego. He describes the intense energy and rage that he felt, which could be triggered by mood swings. He underscores the importance of appearances, explaining how he maintained the facade of a regular person even while he committed his crimes. Throughout his confession, Kemper frequently alludes to his mother's influence on his actions. He portrays her as a toxic and domineering figure in his life, contributing to his violent tendencies. He shares disturbing incidents from his childhood, such as his mother's insistence on consuming the flesh of their pet chickens, which may have played a role in his psychological development. Well, girls, we just non-stop talking. It was a non-stop conversation. And there's a story that at one point he glimpsed her undressed in the bedroom up to uh, the Berkeley UC campus to feed the squirrels. Last night we ate fudge. 
I was all excited because I hadn't seen her for a while. She was supposed to be at a dance studio. Knew what bus she was supposed to take. Maybe you should have just missed the bus. Maybe you should have just ran over. Frida and Elfrida found Ed to be kind of creepy. Kemper continues to recount specific instances of his crimes, highlighting moments where he narrowly escaped detection. He acknowledges that he could have been apprehended multiple times, but managed to avoid it due to the bystander's reluctance to get involved or his own ability to deceive the police. He also reflects on his fascination with television crime shows and how they provided insights into police procedures and criminal behavior. He mentions the need to avoid discussing his crimes with others to evade suspicion and describes his encounters with law enforcement officers while having firearms and evidence of his crimes in his possession. In the final moments of his confession, Kemper touches upon the concept of the friendly nuisance, a term he uses to describe his interactions with law enforcement. He suggests that some serial slayers may go undetected as long as they remain discreet and do not share their activities with others. Kemper implies that it was ultimately his decision to turn himself in, marking the end of his slaying spree. The chilling account of Edmund Kemper provides a glimpse into the mind of a serial slayer, shedding light on the complexities of his motivations, his ability to maintain a dual life, and the profound impact of his actions on his own psyche. His confession serves as a stark reminder of the dark and disturbing aspects of human nature. Imprisonment Confined within the walls of the California medical facility, Kemper shared his living space with infamous figures of criminal history, including Herbert Mullen and Charles Manson. Among them, Kemper harbored a particular disdain for Mullen, whose own slaying spree unfolded concurrently and in close proximity. Standing at an imposing 6 feet 9 inches, Kemper towered over Mullen by a foot, a stark physical reminder of Kemper's dominance. In an attempt to assert control, Kemper resorted to manipulation and physical intimidation, recounting an episode where he doused Mullen with water to quell his disruptive behavior, only to later reward him with peanuts when he acquiesced. This method Kemper termed behavior modification treatment. Despite the chilling backdrop of his past, Kemper managed to carve out an unexpected role as a model prisoner within the broader inmate population. In a testament to his peculiar slays, he took charge of organizing fellow inmates' appointments with psychiatrists. Additionally, Kemper revealed a hidden talent in crafting intricate ceramic cups, showcasing a level of dexterity and creativity that defied the sinister context of his life. Furthermore, Kemper found purpose in a philanthropic endeavor, becoming a prolific narrator for an audiobook program dedicated to assisting the visually impaired. By 1987, he had become the linchpin of the prison's initiative, accumulating an astounding 5,000 hours of recorded material and several hundred completed audiobooks. This venture came to an end in 2015, following a debilitating stroke that rendered Kemper medically disabled. Tragically, in 2016, Kemper incurred his first rules violation for failing to provide a urine sample, marking a stark departure from his otherwise orderly prison record. Message of don't hitchhike seriously. And we did see a change. Do you hitchhike? Right, so mm -hmm. girls being chopped up and things like that. All without any suspect whatsoever. The guy was uh, he covered his tracks really well. Man who didn't dress or look any different than lots of student types. It's the same acrimonious relationship with his mother that his father had had. Sit there and not be a major part of the conversation, but he was just basically listening and. And she was really good at making pie. Everybody was always happy when she would come to a. Throughout his imprisonment. Kemper participated in numerous interviews, shedding light on the psyche of serial slayers. FBI profiler John Douglas regarded Kemper as one of the most intellectually astute inmates he encountered. Noting his rare insight for a violent criminal, Douglas developed a personal fondness for Kemper, finding him friendly, open, sensitive, and possessing 
a good sense of humor. Kemper willingly discusses the heinous nature of his crimes, emphasizing that his interviews aim to prevent others from following a similar path. In one interview, he implores those struggling with violent urges to seek help, emphasizing that merely thinking about such acts is not a crime. He highlighted the insidious nature of these thoughts and their potential to spiral out of control. This motive underlined his interview with French writer Stéphane Bourguin in 1991. Despite his eligibility for parole starting in 1979, Kemper has been consistently denied release, choosing to waive his hearing several times. He expressed understanding that society is not prepared for his reintegration, given the gravity of his offenses. This sentiment was echoed by the prosecutor, Ariadne Simmons, who emphasized the enormity of his crimes in his 2007 parole hearing. As of his last parole hearing in 2017, Kemper remains incarcerated, with his next eligibility scheduled for 2024. That's all for this video, folks. See you next time.